are these people? Speaking of Lazarus, um, you brought yeah. this. So we're going to get a little theological for this segment. So I actually, I got really inspired. This happens with me sometimes. We've noticed this very well. Mm -hmm. um, Zionism has been thrown around a lot, especially in the last few months, given what's happening in Gaza. But I think often we think about Zionism in terms with Judaism and not so much in terms of how, one, you don't have to be Jewish to be Zionist, and we know this from Biden, has declared himself to be a raging Zionist, and he's Catholic, allegedly. Um, so we don't necessarily talk about Zionism on the Christian aspect of the ideology. And mm -hmm. having grown up in the church, um, not to say I got, like full on into the whole Israel thing. Well, I know I got to it around the Bush years, right? There was a giant mm -hmm. evangelical block of the electorate at the time, right? That mm -hmm. the Republicans were definitely catering to, right? At that moment in time, which they still do, which is still part of the problem. But I remember documentaries and stuff then explaining about this. Right, where um you know, there's this end times myth, right? Of yeah. you know, uh you have to have the Jews in Israel fighting a holy war, right, for Jesus to come back. Come back. Right. We're, so Yeah, we're gonna get into that. we're gonna get yeah. into that. So Jesus is the bread. He is the bread, Tom. Um He's the bread. <laughs> So his blood is the yeah, wine, gonna... which that's not that's not weird at all to be drinking blood. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like also how much fucking alcohol that man drink if his blood alcohol is fucking six point two, you know, Bordeaux, homie. You know what I mean? Like, uh And as someone who's had communion wine, couldn't they get a better wine? Why is that shit well, gross? Well, it can't be like expensive wine. You, you can get good cheap wine. That's a thing. Yeah, you know? but it depends. Like depending on the congregation, it may not be worth. Put me some fucking Zinfandel the in money. there, dog. So, something, you know, like shit. Well, they pass that collection well, plate around a lot, Colin. I bet they can afford <laughs> some fucking better wine. And these stupid crackers. What are these? <laughs> like, give me some real bread, dog. You know. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I'm just ranting about Southern Communion being terrible, bro. And don't laugh when they pull out the Wonder Bread as Communion bread. Just don't fucking <laughs> laugh at that shit. That is not good. Not <sighs> Wonder Bread. <laughs> uh, Dipping it in grape juice, bro. You like, bro? I've been there. It's looking hard in the South, all right? Hard. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's get into <laughs> it. Um, so this article is from Trufelt. Uh, this was actually written three years ago uh, by Jonathan Brennan, Bremen and Aiden Orley. Uh, Op-ed piece. And they write, progressives can't ignore the role of Christian Zionism in colonization of Palestine. The forced displacement of Palestinians is funded by the millions of dollars Christian Zionists send to Israel yearly. So again, we talk more about the Israeli lobby uh, in recent months regarding their finances and how their finances have helped to kind of spear a lot of policy uh almost to the detriment of other people but we don't talk about christian zionists and the role they play so let's get into it um over the past several weeks the world has witnessed palestinians continuing to resist forced displacement apartheid and brutal military occupation now keep in mind this was three years ago so i guess you know like 
they been talking about apartheid prior to October seventh, right, Reef? Yeah. So definitely. There have been outcries around the world calling for solidarity and to hold the Israeli government accountable. Again, they were talking about this back then. Um, missing in a lot of the circulating narratives, however, is the indisputable role that the powerful Christian Zionist movement plays, both now and in the long and bloody history of the colonization of Palestine. Christian Zionists are leading a call for the U.S. to unconditionally support Israel's expulsion of Palestinians in Jerusalem and, Isra and Israel's bombing of Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Christian Zionist leaders regularly character Palestinian resistance to their displacement as Jew hatred, appropriating anti Semitism to hinder Palestinian rights. Recently, John Hagee, that's that guy in the picture there, the chairman mm -hmm. and founder of Christian United for Israel, the largest pro Israel lobby in the US, probably at the time, tweeted that Jerusalem and Israel belong to the Jewish people and encouraged Christians to take a stand against evil and show unconditional love and support for Israel. Christian Zionism is by far the largest movement supported authoritarian policies in the Israeli government outside of Israel, an essential bloc within the larger U.S. Christian right. The most politically active Christian Zionist movements are motivated primarily by the belief that Jews taking control over the biblical land of Israel will bring about Jesus' second coming and the end of the world, when Christians will reach salvation and non-Christians, including Muslims and Jews, will be annihilated. So, funny no one talks about that. Like Another thing, another, another thing that, um, I'm trying to remember the name of this book, I think it's called The Other Side, The Secret Relationship Between Nazism and Zionism. You heard of this? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'll go to the thesis of the book, right? This is put together by a guy named Abbas, right? Um, working with a Russian guy, I do believe. Um, the thesis of the book is that the Zionist movement and its leaders were the partners of the Nazis in planning and carrying out the Holocaust. He builds the case of the Havara Arrangement of 1933, in which the Third Reich agreed with the Jewish agency to enable Jews to immigrate from Germany directly to mandatory Palestine, which he sees as evidence of collaboration. So that's how far this goes back. Mm hmm Right, is that you know the Zionist movement led a broad campaign of incitement against the Jews living under Nazi rule to arouse right. the government's would... hatred of them to fuel vengeance. Right, so mm -hmm. I would argue it's... though, and given within the article, it goes even farther back than the 1940s, actually. Right, what every make the argument. Every racist in the world was given the green light and first and foremost Hitler and the Nazis to do with the Jews as they wish, as long as it ensures Jewish immigration to Palestine. That's that was some of this. So Right. You know. Uh yeah. But anyway, let's continue. Mm -hmm. These end time theologies have roots in sixteenth century Protestantism in Europe and reflect the colonial context in which they were formed. Christian Zionism as a political movement gained traction as part of the 19th century fundamentalist movement in Britain and the US when figures such as Lord Shaftesbury, John Nelson Darby, and William Blackstone began Lord proselytizing the end, times, the end times prophecy and conjuring up ideas of a Jewish homeland in Palestine decades before prominent Jewish Zionists called for the same. Britain's Arthur Balfour, whose Balfour mm. Declaration promised a Jewish homeland in Palestine, we did a segment on him maybe like four weeks ago, yeah. um, was himself a noted Christian Zionist, was a, as was President Woodrow Wilson, sorry, who co-signed the declaration at the encouragement of Jewish Zionist Supreme Court Judge Louis Brandeis. Jewish Zionism is a newer development than Christian Zionism, but alliances were formed between the majority Ashkenazi Jewish Zionists in Europe seeking a Jewish state and the Christian Zionists who were located in the highest offices in the US and British governments. Indeed, it was Christian Zionists who had the imperial and military power necessary 
to occupy and colonize Palestine at the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And it was the League of Nations, which is the predecessor to the United Nations, led by Western Christian majority powers who ultimately partitioned Palestine and Israel. No doubt, Christian Zionist leaders viewed the displacement of Jews out of Europe into Palestine as a convenient solution to the Jewish question, whereby the Jewish state would serve as a proxy for Western imperialist imperial interests in a geopolitically strategic region and Jewish bodies used as a sword and shield against a centuries old Muslim enemy. The colonization of Palestine is rooted in and largely continues to serve Western Christian imperialist interests at the expense of Palestinians, Muslims, and Jews. And we're mm -hmm. going to go a little bit more about that in terms of the colonization and the imperialist aspect of this later. Mm -hmm. um, but even in this article, they kind of mentioned that it's based around, I'll say it, white supremacy, essentially. Mm. Um, the caucasity. The caucasity, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, many Christian Zionists today view the 1948 establishment of the State of Israel, which created the Nakba, or expulsion of about 50, 20, what, 750,000 Palestinians, as go. a fulfillment of biblical end times prophecy. The Israeli occupation of the West Bank, Gaza, and the Golan Heights beginning in 1967 similarly is interpreted as a sign that God is blessing Israel and paving the way for Jesus' return. Subsequent Jesus wars, invasions, subsequent wars, invasions, and offenses have been seen as escalating measures that foreshadow the end times that will bring Christians into salvation and annihilate non-Christians. In other words, Christian Zionism responds positively to conflict, in particular Israeli state aggression towards Palestinians. Just think about this, like in terms of Mike Johnson right now. Like <laughs> I'm thinking about it in the terms of like in he's high just school doing this, basically. Se senior year of my high school, so story time. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> me and my buddies. So there was that. Do you remember when they were like saying the rapture was going to happen, and like. 2011, right? 20, 2010, around there, right? It's one of those end times myths. Some Florida preacher, or whatever, knew it was coming, right? And uh, anyway, me and my friends decided what we'd do is we'd all pool together old sets of clothes, right? And we went out and laid out clothes. Like the people wearing the clothes had just been raptured the night before, and right. it was the most hilarious thing we <laughs> I've ever done. It was like got in the newspaper the next morning, you know, and we had this like fountain in the middle of town, right? It was really like a roundabout to get anywhere in town, and like we poured soap in that, you know, like that powdered detergent. Or whatever, so it was just bubbles everywhere. It was great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's what I'm thinking about it as. I just I remember yeah, that's but the... it kind of makes sense given mostly Republicans, but then some Democrats as well who claim Christianity, especially if they're more the evangelical band, how yeah. they vote. Yes. So because there is a lot of Christian Zionism in terms of that, too. So right. It's why APAC needed to go talk to Trump and make sure he was on right. board. You exactly. Know? Right. Um, and for all intents and purposes, even though Trump, I mean, he claims I argue nominally yeah. like Christian, probably, and it's, I can argue Biden, too, right. but, you know, kind of plays along with this as well. Um yeah. So anyway, let's see, where was I? Um, in other words, Christian Zionism responds positively to conflict, in particular Israeli state aggression towards Palestinians. Regard for Palestinian life and land, including Palestinian Christians, is absent from Christian Zionism since Jewish rule over Palestine, Palestine is key to unlocking the end times. Mm -hmm. um, today, Christian Zionists are estimated to number at least in the tens of millions, far greater than the population of world Jewry. In U.S., 
Christian Zionists are the most numerous and the most right-wing voting bloc for Israel. The largest Christian Zionist organization, CUIF, boasts 10 million members, far eclipsing the 100,000 members belonging to AFAC, the much more famous pro-Israel lobbying organization. So, you know, so we talk about AFAC being a big deal, and I don't think we necessarily talk about the CUIF at all. But mm -hmm. they're making the argument, no, they're even bigger than that. So yeah. um, out of one out of every four adults in the United States identifies as evangelical Christian, and 80% of evangelical Christians, or 20% of the U.S. population, reportedly believe the gathering of millions of Jews by the state of Israel signifies the, mean the nearing of Jesus' second coming. The power of Christian Zionism in the U.S. is summed up in a recent interview with Ron Dermer, a close ally of Israeli far, -wing, far right, is right wing Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and a former Israeli ambassador to the United States. And he says, "The backbone of Israel's support in the United States is evangelical Christians." It's true because of numbers and also because of their passionate and unequivocal support for Israel. About 25% of Americans, some people think more, are, in, are evangelical Christians. Less what? than 2% of Americans are Jews. What about the if 10%? Look at just, hmm? What about the 10%? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you look... Just at numbers, you should be spending a lot more time doing outreach to evangelical Christians than you would to Jews. But also look at the passionate support. For the most evangelicals in the United States, certainly, certainly for many of them, Israel is one of the most important issues to them. For some, it's number one. For others, it may be number two or number three. It's very rare to hear evangelicals criticize Israel. Many of probably the most egalitarian anti-Palestinian policies. What's that? I can probably zoom in. There you go. I could, well, I was able to see it before, but thank you for doing it. Um, many of the most egalitarian and anti-Palestinian policies by the United States are led by Christian Zionists. Former President Donald Trump's foreign policy on Israel was largely appeasing his evangelical Christian base, who voted for him at the margin of four to one. On the other hand, a much smaller number of American Jews, somewhere between 21% and 30%, voted for Trump. Christian Zionists occupy the highest office of the Trump administration, remember this was written back in 2021, yep. including former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and former Vice President Mike Pence, and Trump's four years in office saw dramatic right-wing shifts in U.S. policy on Israel, including the cutting of U.S. funding to the UNWA, UNRWA, the agency, the agency responsible for supporting Palestinian refugees, recognizing Israel's illegitimate claims to the Golan Heights, moving the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, and withdrawing from the nuclear Iran nuclear deal, which we covered. Yahoo's right. What's that? We covered that. Yeah, like way back in the day. It's one of our first INN news. One of our first, yeah, yeah, um, so... shows, yeah. Um. Bibi's right-wing government had wanted to institute some of these changes for years, but it was only because of, Trump, of the Trump administration and his Christian Zionist base that Yen Yahu was finally able to do so. So, you know, so actually, let me keep reading and then I'll say what I gotta say. While most Christian Zionist money flows through churches and is therefore difficult to track, Christian Zionist funding sends millions of dollars annually to Israel including to support Jewish immigration to Israel and right-wing Israeli organizations and settlements in service of their goals of regathering the Jews, Palestinian displacement, and greater Israeli control. So, Bibi ain't worried at all, like, about Trump. I think that could be said, you know, already. But it's basically win-win for Bibi, assuming that he stays in power through the end of the year, and assuming that Trump becomes president by the end of the year. Um, so, yes, the argument can be had that Trump will be way worse on Israel and a little bit more, way more uh, upfront about it. 
But that doesn't give the excuse to say of Biden what he's doing is any better, especially him being complicit in a genocide and seemingly both sizing the issue uh, mm. on that, trying to um, kind of make nice with Arab slash Muslim Americans, but then continuing to send weapons uh, to Israel and not following through with the ICC, you know, wanting to give BB the business that, you know, we're basically, you know, we, saying we talked don't about do that. We talked about what? That they wanted to blame everything on BB anyway. Right? Mm -hmm. We covered that not that long ago from Caitlin Johnstone. Right? To where now, the minute that the ICC goes, well, let us arrest the asshole and all the other assholes. They're at the top of this. They're like, no, wait, hold on. Hold, hold on a second. Like, right. we didn't mean actually blame them. You know, we just meant, like, figuratively blame them you know mm -hmm. blame them in your mind like right. so this is why i tell people what rhetoric is just that rhetoric what your actions and behavior mark should mark you as a person so the idea again the idea as you said you know then then not moving in terms of the rhetoric that they seem to are uh, well, by making himself tough to self tough, again, Yahoo. Um, hmm. But anyway, I see you. IF does not constitute President Biden's base of support. Christian Zionism is shifting the U.S. conversation on as the movement continues to grow. The Biden's dream restored to the UNRWA, but will not reverse many of Trump's other Christian Zionist influence policies including the U.S. Embassy move to Jerusalem, despite having been major departures from decades of U.S. foreign policy. CIF has grown to 10 million members from just 2 million in 2015, and Christian evangelical evangelicalism is believed to be one of the fastest growing religions in the world, forming an even larger base of U.S. and political, global political and financial support for Israel's right wing. Mm -hmm. Current U.S. Israeli aggression towards Palestinians is an outgrowth of long held Israeli Jews, especially wealthy Ashi Kanazism over Palestinians. Uh, oh, what happened? Your, your uh, signal was running oh. out. Oh, no. So, uh, you can just come on. back if you want. Um, no, I think I that helps. It's there. We go. Let's make sure it stays. I think it you did oh. it. It's okay. I can read it though. Um, it'll clear up in a second. Okay. Um, so current Israeli aggression towards Palestinians is an outgrowth of long held Israeli policies that privilege Jews, especially wealthy Ashkenazism of Palestinians. But tens of millions of Christian Zionists constitute the global movement supporting, instigating, and pushing the expansion of Israeli state control over the Holy Land at whatever cost. Okay. While Christian Zionist movements largely outpace Jewish Zionist movements in their numbers as well as in their extremist authoritarian views, the two movements continue to use one another for their own gain. As many Jewish Zionists hail Balfour, an avid anti-Semite, as a hero, they are happy to overlook the anti sentinism of Christian Zionists to bolster the shared vision of an apartheid Jewish supremacist state in historic Palestine. For example, even when U.S. politicians distance themselves from John Hagee of his overtly anti sentimentalist views, uh, the DFL, the ADL, rem remains silent. The alignment of establishment, establishment Jewish organizations with right wing anti sentimentalist organization for the benefit of the Israeli right wing is dangerous for progressive movements in Palestine, the United States, and around the world. Okay. Um, indeed, Christian Zionism must be challenged as a powerful threat to a larger progressive agenda, because Christian Zionism is predicated on Christian salvation co coinciding with the end of the world and annihilation of non-Christians, Christian Zionism is at its core anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic. 
the anti-Muslim sentiments of many Christian Zionist leaders are often overt and indisputable. Prominent figures such as Hagee, Chuck Pierce, and Pat Robinson have referred to Islam as satanic and the devil, and are key actors in the U.S. anti-Muslim industry. On the other hand, Zionists use credit on the way support of the state of Israel rooted in real sentimentism, the fetishization and objectification of Jews, to make it seem that they care for Jews while using Jews as pawns in their anti-drama and believing Jews are ultimately damned to hell. More broadly, many Christian Zionist communities adhere to a larger Christian right agenda, fighting against abortion and LGBTQ rights, contradicting any claims that they care for peace and freedom. You're my freedom. <laughs> to overlook the impact of Christian Zionism on the ongoing colonization of Palestine is to overlook the original and largest worldwide movement seeking full Jewish control in Palestine, and one of the largest and most consequential anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic, and anti-democratic movements of our time. Christian Zionism has informed Western policy on Palestine since at least the Balfour Declaration in 1917, and continues to be the backbone of global support for ongoing occupation, apartheid, and displacement. Progressives committed to Palestinian rights and liberation, as well as Muslim and Jewish safety, will be limited as long as they fail to directly challenge this behemoth of a movement. Um, any thoughts on this? Nope. That sounds, sounds about like what I was talking about earlier, right? No. Right. So. Yeah. So. Yep. Balfour, all the, all, all the fun names that we all remember. <laughs> you know. But, um, yeah, so I think, so this kind of shows, so it's not just APAC mm. that we should be worried about, is the Christian Zionist lobby as well, and we it doesn't get mentioned in the news at all. Like, I think, in giving that, not to say APAC isn't like an issue, they are, but if APAC didn't exist, then a lot of these Christian Zionist organizations will continue to exist, and because they give money through churches, you know, that money is not necessarily, it's a little more overt um, in terms of, you know, the spending that they can use in order to, you know, essentially bring Jesus back. <laughs> all Jesus. Is, what is all said and done. Um, so anyway, oh, I Jesus wanted Christ. to talk, we talked about we talked a little bit about the imperialistic bend of Christian Zionism. So mm. this is uh, a lecture that Reverend Dr. Munfer Isaac gave. I'm not sure when he did this. You might know him like during uh, over Christmas when there was a drone strike that hit that church. This was, That was the church that he speaks at. So he was the one that gave that uh, Christmas sermon um, back in December. This is the guy um, that is going to be speaking now. So he's going to talk more about Christian Zionism, but he's going to talk more about the imperialist and colonial as colonialization aspect of this ideology as it uh, refers to Christians. So, right. um, so let's go into it a little bit. We're not going to play the whole thing. I think we'll 10 minutes of it. Um, okay, and then we can continue to talk about it from there. Cool. Action. Presentation. So Christian Zionism defined, if you wish uh, to get a straightforward with definition, I, I like Robert Smith's definition in his book, More Desire Than Our Own Salvation. It is political action informed by specifically Christian commitments to promote or preserve Jewish control over the geographic area now comprising Israel and Palestine. I like this definition it because it reminds for you? us that we're talking not simply about a theological yeah, I know it's kind of low, or a theological but yeah, school, but about a political movement, a political action. Uh, and when it comes to how this political movement functions, Stephen Sizer in one of his books uh, identifies at least these six ways in which Christian Zionists uh, act on behalf of Israel or support uh, Israel better. by political lobbying on yeah. behalf of Israel. And as I said, this has been very much manifested during the Trump presidency. 
which was fueled by the support of evangelicals and one of their tenants was the support for Israel. And this was translated to political decisions like the movement of the embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, and one of Trump's famous quotes about this when he said, I did it for the evangelicals. I didn't do it for Israel. Just think of that. Um, they support and finance Jewish immigration to the land, which when you pause a little bit again to think of it from a Palestinian perspective, these are my sisters and brothers donating money for people to come from outside of my land, take my land, and have more rights than the rights I have in my land. So to us Palestinians, this is just mind-boggling. Uh, support the settlements, politically and financially. Uh, this is well documented. And one of the shocking figures is how much money goes from churches to settlement projects. Uh, and we're not talking about thousands of dollars or millions of dollars. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of millions and in some cases, but you know, lots of money is going to Israeli settlements. Settlements that most uh, diplomats recognize as the main obstacle to peace and to the two-state uh, solution. Obviously, they, they oppose the division of Jerusalem and uh, again, the movement of the embassy. Some radicals support the rebuilding of the temple and this will have catastrophic results. And most oppose any peace process and any giving of the land to the Palestinians, which they see as a compromise. Of course, they're sitting at the comfort of their offices and you know, defining reality uh, for us. What's common again in the DNA of Christian Zionism is that we are missing as Palestinians. We are ignored at best and dehumanized at worst. Uh, this is the kind of uh, one of the most common things I see among Christian Zionists. They uh, act as if the land is empty, as if Israel was created on an empty land. Uh, this is seen in the infamous uh, 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 slogan that this. Yep. So. He brings up what we've talked about is the I and I think this is kind of the problem that I know with many Zionists, at least online, like when they kind of go into, you know, like they had a right to take the land. Like it was based on the idea of them thinking, oh, it was empty or uninhabitable. Like again, like Zionists were proposing you got well, East Africa to be Israel. But again, that was the same argument was, oh, there's no one living there. Like the fuck you mm -hmm. know there were people living there it's um so so yeah i think that's and no one's necessarily saying it but it's the idea of you know i think just given what scientists say online is the uh, they never talk about palestinians they're always ignored or mm -hmm. not mentioned at all and so so it doesn't necessarily compute with them in terms of when people are you know, advocating for them, it's almost like you're advocating in a way, I think in their mind, it's like you're advocating for people that don't exist, essentially. But at least that's kind of the tone I get from many people who are pro-Israel. It's the idea of, yeah, we have a right to land, like no one was living there, but then like, oh, those people that you care about, what what's what's their deal why why do you care about them so much right so um so yeah i think just the idea of zionist or at least the initial belief was the land was empty and ours for the taking you know that's kind of the core one of the core aspects of zionism that i think for both jews and christians that you know is very subtle in terms of how people talk about it but it's there um, you can go ahead. Zionist promoted, which uh, many Christian leaders in Britain in particular promoted before Zionism was birthed. The idea of a land without people for a people, without a land, which before that was uh, a, a country without a nation for a nation without a country. Uh, and th th the main premise here is that the land was empty. But you know too well the land was not empty. Actually, they knew too well the land was not empty. And in the case of the British mandate, uh, it's not just the Belfort Declaration or everything related to it. They knew too well that the land was not empty because they occupied us. Mm -hmm. Yet still our land was described as a land without people because as uh, Ben White put it in his book, uh, uh, yes, they knew that the land has people, but for them, we, the Palestinians, were a complete irrelevance. For the Zionist Palestine was empty, not literally, but in terms of people of equal worth to the incoming settlers. This is a typical colonial mentality and dare I say a typical colonial Christian mentality. Yes, the land has people, but they can be shifted. Uh, we can control their fate. Uh, and today we still hear the idea, why don't you go to Jordan? 
Today, we still hear debates like this. Do Jews have a divine right to Israel's land? Uh, uh, where a discussion is, is made about our land, they call it Israel's land, but uh, we are continually ignored in such discussions. This is an example of a discussion in Christianity today. The two authors are an American leader and a Messianic Jewish American leader sitting at the comfort of their offices, discussing our land as if it's empty. And you know, what about our perspective? But you see, our perspective does not matter. That's the issue. And by the way, in this case, I actually emailed Christianity today saying, can I respond? At the time, I was still writing my PhD on the topic, and I lived in this land. But that didn't give me the merit in their eyes to actually be part of the conversation. Why? Because we don't matter. Yes, the land has people. They knew that, but it doesn't matter. Because true understanding of the Bible and uh, uh, righteous acts come from us. That's the whole uh, uh, nation. Uh, to me, this is the original war. Uh, in that we are invisible uh, in theology books. We don't exist. We are invisible in the language of the church. Uh, I call this the myth of returning to an empty land. That's the myth that many, many, if not most Christians simply assume. If you ask them about Palestinians, they probably don't know, not only that, you know, much about us, but they're, they're shocked to know Palestinian Christians exist. And at best they, they describe an idea of Israel creating a garden of Eden in the middle of the desert. It was an empty land. The idea of returning you know, again, puts me as a Palestinian in the wrong place. It's as if I have occupied someone else's land, even though this is the land of our ancestors. The same applies, by the way, to how most pilgrims today, when they come to the Holy Land, spend at best two hours in Bethlehem. Why? Because, you know, again, we don't exist. And if we exist in their mind, we are the dangerous, backward people on the other side of the world. People to be feared, people to be dehumanized. Uh, and uh, in the mentality of the wall, those we isolate or separate to the other side of the wall, because they, in their understanding, brought it to themselves, they're terrorists, they're uh, radical Islam and so on, you can stereotype who, whatever way you want. And actually you can then justify all acts of violence against them. That is the mentality. That's, that's what I mean by a colonial uh, DNA or a colonial uh, theology. When you look at Palestinians as less humans. I'm gonna unpack this more now. As I looked at certain elements in the theology of Christian Zionism and try to illustrate it by certain uh, example. Uh, and so let's look at now what I mean precisely by that idea of uh, imperial theology. First of all, we have the, the whole employment of God. It's not simply that we're talking about a chosen people, a theological principle, now it's, it's even a chosen state. Uh, uh, God is on Israel's side. And as such, we must be on the right side and stand with Israel because we want to stand with God. This is how one Christian Zionist leaders and one of the most influential in the 80s put it. To stand against Israel is to stand against God. It's, it's plain simple. We believe that history and scripture prove that God deals with nations in relation to how they deal with, uh, with Israel. You see how God here is brought to a struggle. And it's shocking to me how when the same Western Christendom criticizes uh, uh, or challenges, uh, calls out Islam for making a conflict religious and using religion in politics, they're perfectly fine applying the same principles on Israel, making the uh, conflict a religious conflict. This is when the conflict was made uh, uh, religious. And so anything we do is opposing God. As I said in this article that I mentioned, do Jews have a divine right? Because what if the answer to such a question is, yes, Jews have a divine right to the land. Where does that leave me as a Palestinian? Can I object? You see, if I object that statement, I would be standing against God. And that's the whole essence of Christian uh, Zionism. In that mentality, the world is divided into us versus them. And them, is the uh, Arab Muslims in this case, are to be feared. Uh, instilling fear is one of the most powerful uh, tools of Christian Zionism. Uh, they, you know, uh, they always, for example, exaggerate the threat of the Arab countries. They always use, for example, there are 250 million Arabs just waiting to uh, destroy Israel. And of course, that myth was uh, you know, put aside, at least for a moment, with the so-called peace deals between Israel and the uh, Arab states. Iran becomes then the, the, the enemy, and even many Christian Zionist leaders called for nuking Iran, just or bombing Iran uh, because of that, because they characterize the other as to be feared. Uh, and that's a, uh, all of this comes from a position of privilege where uh, mm. you know, we, we act as if we're superior to others. Uh, I call this you know, assuming that there are us and them where the Judeo-Christian tradition 
uh, uh, is superior to everything else, especially in this case uh, to Islam. Uh, and, and that's really uh, the essence of that term, how at least it is used by many, the whole idea of the Judeo-Christian tradition as we are superior to others. Yeah, so um, Reverend Isaac calls it out. It's basically the well, primacy of it all, the caucasity of it all, the, mm -hmm. but you know, but more important, yeah. But it's the idea of we're be we're better than you, like, or essentially our religion is superior than yours. And I feel like saying without saying that many people believe still that Islam is such a backwards religion. Um, so the people that practice it do not matter. So, but it's the idea of, again, using religion in a way that Christianity was used to justify slavery for me and my family um, to justify, you know, taking over. Like It just basically, as we've said, on the show before, it's manifest destiny for the Jews, essentially. Yeah. Um, this is exactly what this reminds me of. I mean, pretty much, I mean, it's practically the same phrasing, you know, what is it from the Sinai to the Nile, that kind of, that kind of thing. And the Euphrates. Mm -hmm. I don't always know. Um, you know, so anyway, uh, is is your birthday coming up? People need to give you birthday bucks. Birthday bucks at co-fee.com slash indie dues network. Scan the QR code on your screen. We'll put the exclamation mark donate in the chat. You know, give him give him some birthday money to do what he wants with. Why not? <laughs> um, if you can't do that, but he'll he'll take birthday wishes in the comment section below tell him happy birthday put put like and subscribe he'll take that too share it he'll 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 like that too. so any questions no good uh not question i would like at least one person new person to subscribe to us before we're out of here tonight yep so sounds good to me Thank you.